Well, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 130. Psalm 130. If you don't have a Bible, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us to you. Make it your own, mark on it, carve it up. We also have the awesome uh, privilege this morning of taking the Lord's Supper together. So everything that we're doing as we move along in the service, we need to be thinking about preparing our hearts to take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. We've been walking through the book of Psalms this spring, and we realize that Psalms are about finding God in the messiness of life. Because life gets messy and we, we go through seasons of, of doubt and confusion. And this morning, I promise I'm going to step all over your toes with this messy season that we're going to be talking about because no one likes waiting. Amen? No one likes waiting. You know what words have never come out of my mouth? I love waiting. That's never been said. You know what has been said of me? Um, I can't wait. I say that often. You know what has never been said of me? You, sir, are a patient driver. <laughs> never been said, not once. Listen, I'm no dummy. I'm not praying for patience because I hate waiting. Does anyone else have the spiritual gift of always picking the worst line at Walmart? You know, without fail, the lady in front of me has picked some unmarked candle and we have to get a special call to the back for a price check. And you know you do this because every time you pick a line, you see this is where I would have been in that line and here's where I am. I think I've got it right. And then inevitably you just watch them pile along and it just eats you up inside, okay? Delays are irritating, aggravating, unnerving. We rise up with impatience, demanding instant gratification. Listen, I watch A&M football games on my phone while I'm shopping with my wife. And the moment it begins to buffer or there's any lag, I'm changing character, uh, carriers, right? This is unacceptable. Amazon Prime has everything under the sun at my door in two days. I cook a pot pie in the microwave, and it takes six minutes. And I spend that time thinking, should I really be waiting this long for food? <laughs> now, I know I've given petty examples, but are we also not just as impatient whenever it comes to waiting on God's timing for the plans of your life? Waiting on the Lord to open the door for your career, Waiting to find Mr. Right. Waiting to start a family. Waiting on the test results to find out if it's cancer. Waiting for the prodigal child to return. Life is filled with seasons of waiting. And especially waiting on the Lord. So if you would, in honor of God's word, you would stand while I read Psalm 1. 30. I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard Version. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ear be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. You may be seated. Now, will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, 
we pause to confess how often, how often we run and turn towards trivial things. We purchase out of a need for instant gratification. We are such consumers when the real cry and the depth of our soul is that we need and we thirst for you. Would you speak to us this morning, Holy Spirit, as only you can? Father, if, if this sermon comes across as harsh words from a pastor, it will lead to nothing but shame. But if your Holy Spirit convicts, you heal and you call us to yourself and there is life. Give us that. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, when the psalm opens, the psalmist is in despair. He feels distant and li- he feels distant from God and life can only be described as out of the depths. You see, the depths are a metaphor for the bottom of the sea. In the Old Testament, it's seen as the watery grave, the chaotic abyss, as far away from God as possible. It is the lowest point on the earth, and God is in the heavens, and the question is, is can God hear? We soon learn that the great chasm of separation is caused by the guilt associated with sin. If you should mark iniquities, who could stand? You see, the psalmist is not confessing one sin. There wasn't one sin in particular that was overwhelming him. Rather, he is taking inventory of his entire life and realizing that all of it is wrought with sin. Where does one prideful act end and one selfish act begin? As James May said, clothed in filthy garments, the flood of wrong and its consequences have swept life along, from which there is no escape apart from God's life raft of of redemption. You see, he is broken. He knows that sin is the reason for his dire situation. That sin is the reason for his distance from God. And yet, he knows that God is the only one who can help. That God is holy and he hears our cries for mercy. Look at verse four. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Friend, that is the good news of Jesus Christ. That only in the cross is God seen as truly holy. That he is the perfect holy set apart. There is no one like him. But only in the cross is the love of God put on full display. See, apart from Jesus, Romans 3 says, your book of deeds will be opened. They will be read. You will stand before a holy a holy God and a holy judge, the holy creator, and every sin will be held accountable for. Every thought, every ill-spoken word. But the same one who is perfect and holy and is offended by your sin is the one who sent his son out of love for you to take the punishment for our sin. The same one, holiness and love, mesh together, meeting in the cross so that you and I can find forgiveness. You see, that's the peace that the psalmist finds in verse four. There is peace, there is rest, there is forgiveness with a holy God. But wait, the psalm is not filled with rest. Rather, it's filled with wrestling. You see, do you see the gap between the forgiveness of verse four and redemption that occurs in verses seven and eight? You know what that gap is called? Waiting. Forgiveness is immediate in Christ. 
that every one of my sins has been nailed to the cross. Hallelujah, I bear it no more. But redemption is the kingdom of God worked out over the course of my life, overcoming the consequences of sin, restoration of years that have been stolen by sin. You see, marriages can be destroyed in a moment, but take years to restore. An abusive father can be forgiven, but redemption is the long road of building trust. Israel as a nation, when the psalmist writes here, Israel is a shell of their former self. In fact, this is a psalm of ascent, meaning that that the Israelites would read it as they were on their way to pilgrim, Uh, on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They would go to the temple and they would read this and, and they would constantly remind themselves that they are forgiven, but they were longing and hoping for the restoration of the nation. Waiting on the Lord. Truthfully, we don't hear much about this, do we? This idea, did you you know that the Bible is filled with the thread of waiting on the Lord? That there is a robust theology of waiting on the Lord? Psalm 25, Psalm 27, Psalm 37, here in Psalm 130. Listen to these three verses out of Isaiah, Isaiah 40, uh, 31. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. Blessed are those who wait for him. No eye has seen a God like you who works on behalf of those who wait for him. You see, to wait is to withhold from lesser things, right? Lesser things to fill that void inside, but instead to wait for the one true thing that is your real desire. Not settling, not resting for hasty movement just for the sake of movement, but rather pausing and waiting on the Lord and declaring only you can genuinely satisfy. I will not turn to substitutes. We've all seen the World War II movies where The dramatic plot line is is lovers who've met and now they are separated by war. And as each of them parts, they look at each other and they say, I will wait for you. You are my love. I will return to you. Now, if just a few months later we find out that she's turned around and run off and found someone else. And that short pit of short gap, we would feel betrayed. We would feel like she didn't wait for him. That love was fake. It wasn't genuine. She settled for a quick, cheap substitute. Do you wait for the Lord? Can you say with the psalmist, I wait for the Lord? My soul does wait, and in his word do I hope my soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. You see, in the Old Testament, the theme is waiting. In the New Testament, the theme becomes patience and perseverance. That is fruit of the Holy Spirit. And catch this. God has planned seasons of waiting in your life. Now, I know you're mad at me for just saying that, but God has planned seasons of waiting in your life. Check out this picture. I think it's great. Whoever drew it, at the top, this is your plan. This is what you think your life is going to look like. But look at God's plan. You know what's in those valleys? Years of waiting for that job promotion. Seeing the wicked prosper while your heavenly father says, wait, that's where we were last week. Seemingly wasted days due to sickness and ailing health. You've got plans and you've got a strategy, but the road to success is muddy. 
It's filled with obstacles that slow you down and even detours that take you off the path. And we ask the question, why? Why do we get a vision for good things in our life? God-given purposes, even a hunger to see God's kingdom come here and now, and yet God says, wait. Have you ever been there? Well, you're not alone. You're in good company. Paul is saved dramatically on the road to Damascus. He goes to Arabia. Galatians tells us for three years. He goes to Arabia, rereads his Bible, gets grounded, begins to understand the gospel, figures out how he missed it all. And after three years, he comes back to Jerusalem. He is pumped because he's ready to preach the gospel to all of his old buddies there in Jerusalem. So he charges into Jerusalem, begins to preach the gospel, and they want to kill him. He, he narrowly escapes out of Jerusalem. He limps back to Tarsus, and you know what he does for the next five to seven years? We don't know. He's forgotten God tells him to sit and wait. It's not for seven years, 10 years after his conversion, that Barnabas comes and finds him and begins, and they go off on their missionary journey. But Paul was ready after year three. Why on earth would God have the apostle Paul sit and wait for five to seven more years? Joseph was enslaved for 13 years. Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years after the promise for Isaac. Israel was enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. 400 years with no prophets before the coming of the Messiah. I'm beginning to think God is not working on my timeline. Hear me clearly. Impatience is not simply a personality trait. Hey, I've got ADD and I'm impulsive. It's just the way I am. For in the realm of faith, impatience is unbelief and a moment for spiritual warfare. That what God intends for good, if Satan can get you to be impulsive or despondent, then he can lead you into grave consequences. And those are the two directions on how we respond to to, uh, impatience, right? It's it's, uh, impulsiveness or being in despair. So let's go down those two roads. Responding to patience with impulsiveness. My first job out of college, I worked as a civil engineer in downtown Dallas, and I had an hour-long commute to work every day, one way. So you're adding two hours to my commute on an already nine-hour work day. So you can imagine that any time there is traffic, I don't respond too well. There is nothing that makes you feel boxed in and just completely helpless, like being parked on a freeway. So inevitably, I now have a hair trigger, and anytime I start to see things start slow down, I jerk off, off to the side roads. I'm on to the wandering through neighborhoods. I'm getting lost. I'm adding time to my commute, and at the end, I I don't care because I'm in control and I'm moving. I don't want to just sit there for goodness sakes. I'd rather be moving, exploring, looking at trees, whatever. I don't care. I'm in control. Now, how often is that the picture of our spiritual life and walk? Amen? Not trusting God's pace and timing. Why aren't we moving ahead? I'm ready for bigger and better things. Impulsively grabbing the wheel, taking control, making rash counter moves, hoping to shortcut God's timing, but instead filling our lives with sinful compromises. Do you remember King Saul waiting on the battlefield for Samuel to come and to give the offering so that they can enter into battle with God's blessing? 
But God's timing was slow. It was slow. His camp began to grumble. The enemy was so large in front of them. And God's timing was slow. Believer, God intends to make you meek, not impulsive. That Greek word meek is one of my, my favorite illustrations in, in terms of the Greek language because it, the same root word was used for when a horse is broken. And when a horse is broken, it's just as strong, it's just as beautiful and fast and magnificent, and yet it's willing to go wherever the leader, the Lord directs. And the charge of the world will be, you are weak. You are weak. Why don't you forge ahead? Why don't you take control? Why don't you carve out your own path? Are you so dependent that you need to wait on God? Yes, I am. So impulsiveness, or the second way, the other way that we respond to waiting is by being discouraged. I give up. God may, God may be about bringing good things for other people, but, but not me. I, I see no movement. It's not going to happen. Beloved, how common is it for us to become discouraged while we wait on the Lord? Guys, that's unbelief. Christians are called to be filled with hope. And hope is faith that God is moving, that he is going to work out all things for my good as he promised. And therefore, I am filled with hope and joy because I trust him. Let me give you three ways to fight discouragement and to be filled with hope while you wait on the Lord. Number one, because God is near. Listen to me, even if the good that you are waiting for in the future, okay, it's, it's good. God loves to give you good things, but God himself is near and God is your portion. And God is calling you to be content and satisfied even in this season of waiting. Is God enough even if you never get the good thing? Is God enough if you can never have kids? If you never get that promotion? If you never see the revival that you long to see and hope for. Is God enough? I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. But number two, okay, God is enough. This is your highest priority. God is enough while you wait. But number two, God is moving, okay? God loves to give his children good gifts. God is moving as he said he would. Second Peter 3, 9, God is not slow concerning his promise as some count slowness. It may feel slow to us, but God is testing your faith in the middle of the waiting. Can he be trusted even if it's not on your timeline? Now listen, every year I have hopes that the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl. For 25 years, I think I won one playoff game. But your hope is only as good as the object you're placing the trust in. 
Which is why when I watched the playoffs this year, I sat there with my arms folded and was like, I know what's coming. I'm not getting my, I know what's coming. But should we respond to the Lord that way? Is he not worthy of our trust? Did he not offer his son for you? He has not forgotten. And he has meant those promises for you. Otherwise, he would not have given them. See, to respond otherwise is unbelief. Waiting is how we prove that we trust God. He is worthy of our hope. We believe that he is moving, even if it's not in our timeline. Do you believe that he is a rewarder of those who wait for him? Because he has said it. Do you believe that? And thirdly, guys, because God is forming our character in the waiting. It's not wasted time. If Jesus needed 30 years to start ministry, I need 300. Do you discourage easily? Quit praying? Have difficulty keeping basic spiritual disciplines? Then I am certain that the bread needs a little longer in the oven. One day in the House of Commons, Disraeli, who was the prime minister, stood up and made a brilliant speech on the spur of the moment. To which a friend later that afternoon said, your extemporaneous talk has been on my mind all day. To which he replied, Madam, that extemporaneous talk has been on my mind for 20 years. We live in a culture of scoffers who rise up just looking for sound bites that make them important for just a moment. But God is not interested in making you wise on Twitter for the next 10 minutes. He's interested in your character and making it who you are. When I was in college, my pastor passed on an important spiritual discipline that I've made a habit in my life and I want to pass on to you. And he stated this, you should make it your habit at least once a week in reading your Bible to sit and wait on the Lord while you're reading. Okay, it's fine to read through the Bible in a year and to have uh, plans and devotionals and all that stuff. But at some point, you need to develop at least once a week where you sit and you read with the expectation through the Holy Spirit, God, I am reading to meet you and to hear from you. I will read until you convict me. And when you convict me, I will sit in it and I will wait. I will absorb it. I will not go any further. I will just sit in the weight of what you have said because I will wait for you. My soul waits for you. God is interested in developing your character. It's not wasted time. Charles Simeon would leave a legacy of kingdom impact that few would ever compare to. He was the pastor of Trinity Church in Cambridge, England, near the famed school. And for 54 years, he would impact the world by sending out preachers and missionaries. But you see, that's the end of the story. Because when Simeon was first appointed to the church, he was met with great hostility. He was very conservative in his view of the Bible, belief in the inerrancy, and the need that everyone would come to uh, a personal born-again experience through the Holy Spirit. And that was not the norm or the standard there at that time. And so the majority of his parishioners boycotted his Sunday morning services. Okay, In the Anglican church, he was appointed, but the people said, well, we ain't coming. And they started going in the afternoon where they could appoint their own preacher. And so the majority of the people only showed up in the afternoons. But you know what they did on Sunday mornings? They locked their pews. You see, in those days, 
They all wanted to sit up front. They weren't back row bad. They wanted to sit up front. And, and you had pews and you actually had locks to them and you paid for those. And so the people said, well, we'll lock our pews. So the only thing available to Simeon are the very back pews and the aisles. For 12 years, he preached this way. 12 years. One, two, four, five, eight, 10, 11, 12 years. He waited patiently preaching the gospel, calling upon, do you think he ever got despondent? He certainly did. Then what did he do? He believed that God was near. He believed that God was moving. That God was going to keep his promises. That as his word is proclaimed, his word will not return void. And he believed that all the while God would be shaping his character into the man that he needed to be to look more like Christ. Waiting on the Lord. Now, if you would, would you take out the Lord's Supper elements? Friend, you need to know and understand that the Lord's Supper is available to all baptized believers. If you know that you've been born again, then we invite you to participate and to partake in this with us. We do this together as a family. By the way, if you didn't get elements on your way in, if you would lift up your hands, we have deacons walking around up here in the front. Anyone else, raise your hand so that you can participate with us. The scripture tells us, believer, do not take this in an unworthy manner. You see, it's a remembrance of Christ's broken body for our sin. Do you need to confess of the sin of impulsiveness this morning? Sometimes having movement for the sake of movement and not waiting on the Lord? Do you need to confess of being in despair because you're waiting? Listen, we're all waiting for something. Are you discouraged? As if God is not faithful, as if those promises are not for you, just for everyone else. I give you a few moments to just do business with the Lord. Confess those sins. Remember his brokenness on your behalf. If he gave his son, will he also not give you all things? While they were eating, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take this, for this is my body. You know, if the bread represents the broken body of Christ and the fact that our sins have been forgiven. Check this out, believer. There is coming a time when we will wait no more. The trumpet will sound. The sky will split. And you will see your Savior face to face. 
the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you will behold and eternity will begin. And this cup represents that day, that day. He said to his disciples, I I won't drink this again. I will withhold until we drink it together in the kingdom. So as you sit here, I give you a few moments to contemplate the one we are waiting for and that very soon the waiting will be over. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Will you pray with me? King Jesus, we wait for you. Our soul does wait. We declare that you are the one that our hearts long for. And no one could ever compare to you. Forgive our impulsiveness. Forgive our despair. Forgive how we quickly turn aside to other things. Help us to trust you. Give us your perspective with life. That you are moving and that you are working on our character. And that as we pray that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done. You will work all these things out for your glory. And you allow us to participate, but oftentimes you say, wait. Help us to find you in the waiting. We love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.